So, hello everybody. So, I, I will introduce me quickly because we don't have much time to write a JIT compiler, so let's start uh, very soon. So, I am Antonio Cuni, I am a PyPy core developer since 2006. I also do some other open source stuff. So the, the scope of, the, of this talk is to show that JIT compilers are not so hard as, they, they, as you could think at the first glance. And uh, so we are going to write a very, very simple JIT compiler for x86 64-bit. Uh, we are going to compile a subset of Python uh, and we are going to do some assumption to make it easier, like all the variables will be of type float and, um, and we, well, we won't compile all the instruction at all, just a, a very simple subset, but it, it's enough to show how things work. Um, we are using a library to encode assembly instruction because it's, well, for Intel architecture it's a hard task and, and that's it. And the disclaimer is that before writing this talk, I never wrote any assembler code before. Uh, so it, this really shows that it is kind of easy enough if you know more or less what to expect. And uh, so since I didn't know much about uh, assembler, what I did was to like compile C programs, compile with the GCC, look at the assembler generated and basically do copy and paste. So for example, you start with this very simple function to add two double numbers and to return them. So what I did was something like this, and then with opt dump. Okay, so these are basically the, um, the bytes that you need to put in memory in order to execute this logic. And then the, the, the next thing you want to to try is well how to how to how to execute something like this from python so basically this is these are the bytes that i showed you before these are it's really a copy and paste of the object dump thing and uh, it corresponds to this assembler instruction so what you need to do is to allocate some memory you need to allocate it with mmmap because you need to say to uh, to tell the kernel that you want to execute this part of memory, you put the code inside a buffer, and then you use, for example, CFFI to, to tell Python that this particular piece of memory contains a function which, which takes to double and return a double, for example. So let's see if it works. So you see that here we have uh, our buff, which is a buffer. So we can, with CFFI, we can get a pointer to this memory. We can cast to a function pointer. And we get a, a, a CFFI function pointer and when we can call it. And it works. And that, that, okay, this is the second time I do this talk and when the first time I got a seg fault at this point, so I'm improving. So, back to the code. Okay, so basically, this is the, the basic idea, so we need to allocate the memory and fill it with the right instructions and execute it and that's how, how you write the JIT compiler. But then, of course, it's much more complicated than this. So let's start from tests. So I want to test that it is going to work, so I'm going to write a compiled function class which wraps all of these. So let's see, pi.test, test JIT. What is it? What is it happening? Okay, so, okay, I don't have this class, let's write it. So, oops. Okay, I'm going to, to cheat a bit because I didn't have enough time to, well, to type everything live. So what we want to do is something like this, I think. Uh, 
So we allocate the buffer. We copy the code inside. We cast it to the, to the right uh, pointer type. And when you call the compiled function, well, you just call the, the CFFI function. And let's see if it works. And it doesn't, right? OK, better. So we are running some code, and it worked. So the next thing we need to do for writing a JIT is to uh, handle registers. So the, our, the modern uh, CPUs have many registers, and when you run your compiled code, you need to decide which values goes in which register. So we are going to write a very simple register allocator in which you mm, in which you assign a variable to a register, and it's so simple that basically we just assign them once. In a modern real JIT compilers have to um, have to um, um, decide when to use a register, when to reuse for something different, where to put a value of a register. In some, uh, um, in some temporary location in memory and et cetera. But since, since this is very simple code, well, we will just um, decide that we use as many registers as for uh, one register for each variable. And then if you use too many variables, then we just give up. So. So for example, we. So we get a, we maintain a dictionary. Which maps a variable to a register. We use this default dict tricked so that we don't have to maintain it by ourselves. And if we don't, we no longer have register, then we just raise not implemented error because it's simple. In, the re in a real code, then you need to handle this case and to, to save the value of the register to some location in memory and, uh, and then the, all the complicated logic. And then to get the value of a register, you just return it from this dictionary. So when the register is not in the dictionary, it goes to the default logic, allocate one, and et cetera. So let's see if our test work, you see? We are checking that the variable number A gets the first register, and the second, and the third, and et cetera. So, okay, light coding. OK, so we are slowly getting to some point in which we, we can actually compile things, because now we have a compiled function which takes care of handling the low-level stuff, a register allocator which, which we will use later. And then let's try to write a real AST compiler. So um, I'm not going to parse the Python code, because it's complex and there, there is no time. So I'm abusing the AST compiler. And basically, with AST, you take Python source code, and you get a tree, which represents your instruction. I will show you some picture. And um, OK, and, and then I w what, what I want to do is to have a class in which I can pass some Python code, compile it, and get a function that then, then I can call. And uh, I want to check that the empty function just returns 0. In my, in my toy language, you have to return a number, so if, if you don't return anything, it will return zero. So of course, if we test it, we have an error because this class doesn't exist. So let's cheat, uh, cheat some more. So 
So I'm using the visitor pattern. I will show you in a while. So basically, the idea is that this class takes the source code. It's parsed with the AST module of Python. And when I compile it, I, I do some magic to generate the, um, the assembler code as bytes to put them in the buffer. And then I can return the compiler function I just wrote. And the visitor pattern, OK, I will show you in a, in, a, in a while. But basically, it means that from this tree that I will show you very soon, I, I, I will call a method of this class for every node of the tree. So if I test it, I see that like, I have this not implemented error for the module method. So let's write it. OK, so now I can use self.show to show the AST, the AST tree. And it should appear there, yes. So this is the tree representation of our source code. So you see that you have a module which contains a function def, which is named foo. It doesn't have any argument. And it contains a statement. And the statement is pass. OK, so the visitor pattern I am using here, basically, it say that, OK, we have a module. And then uh, the module node, it's opening here. The module node has an attribute which is body, which contains all the statements. Um, so what I want to do is for child in node.body, self.visit child. And this is going to recursively visit all the nodes. And the idea is that when you visit a node, you emit the assembler code for the statement you are, um, you are, you are um, visiting now. So now I expect that if I run it, I will get an error because function def doesn't exist. And indeed. So let's implement function def. Def function def. Self node. So the arg name, arg names of the function are something like arg dot arg for arg in node dot arg dot arg something like this. So I new function. I create a new function. I will show you the implementation of these in a while. And then the, 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 the important thing is, again, to recurse into the, the children of, of this guy and to visit them. And since we need to return something, because in assembler we can't return none, we return 0 by default. And we return it using the ASS, ASM object, which I will create in, uh, shortly. So the assembler uh, usual way of returning 0 is to store a value with itself. So, so we store the XMM0 register with itself. And we return it. And then, of course, now we need the new func function. And what it, what, what it does is to create the ASM thing, which is the function assembler, which is what, something that I didn't show, but it's basically, it, it, ma it makes it possible to just write nice mnemonics as method instead of having to put the byte in the buffer. It is the PitchPy library I was telling you about. Then we need to allocate to, do, to create our uh, allocator. Then we need to allocate a register for every argument.
So it is a locator register for every argument, and the calling convention says that the first argument is in the XMM register number zero, then the first in the XMM one, and etc. So since our register locator returns them in the right order, if we assign the first register to the first argument, we, we already ensure that the arguments, the value of the arguments are in the correct register. And uh, since I'm going to use two temporary register during, during the compilation, well, I just allocate them. These are, it, these are like having two temporary variable. Hope, hopefully the source code will not use in these names. If they do, well, you get a problem. So of course, in a real world example, you need to handle this case. So let's see if we are improving. And yes, now we, we, we just need to implement the path statement, which is the, the leaf of our body. And let's implement it by, well, we don't need to emit any code for the path statement, of course. And, the, and success. So we manage with, by writing these uh, methods and following the visitor pattern, to, to pass this, this very first test, which took a while of, of putting things all together, but now we have a framework in which we can easily implement all the, all the other uh, features of our JIT. So the second test we want is to return a simple constant. So let's, let's see what happens. Okay, I need to implement the return statement. So def return self node. I, will, I want to show you the AST again. So this is the AST I have now. And you see I have the return statement, which takes the num expression, which takes the constant 100. So what I need to do, well, is to, is to write methods for all these node subclasses. So the idea for evaluating an expression is to use the stack. So w whenever you have uh, uh, a tree of expression with binary expression uh, uh, operands and etc., what you, what you want to do is to evaluate the two children, put them on the stack, then pop the two value of the from the stack and compute the value. This way you can handle easily deeply recursive um, data structure like binary expression and expression in general. So what I want to do for the return statement is that I want to visit, so the uh, node.value. So this is going to put the value 100 on top of the stack. So then I want to pop the value of the stack inside the register XMM0, which is the register which is used to return a value from a function. And then I want to emit the return assembler, this instruction in assembler. And this, of course, is going to fail now because I need to implement the num thing. And then when I visit a num node, uh, what I want to do is to put a number in, um, on the stack. So I need to use the move as the instruction, and I want to load the value inside the temporary register zero, and I want it to be a constant value, and the value is node.n. So in my example, node.n is 100. And then once I have the value in, in the register, I can push it on the stack. So you see what happens? So by, by using visit, I'm walking down the tree. And then when I emit the code for the leaves, I put value on the stack. The stack, at, at, the stack is at runtime. And then visiting the, 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 the nodes up, uh, you pop value of the stack, you compute, you put it on the stack again, and et cetera. And by doing this, at the end, you have, well, your the result you, you are supposed to have. So let's see if it works. 
Ok, push D. Push SD. I think it is. And it works. And so, so we need basically to to continue, so I have more tests, so I want to handle arguments. So in this, in this case, we pass two arguments, which are going to be in a register XMM0 and 1, as I said, and I want to return one of the two. So if we execute, we don't have the name, so let's, let's see what up, what's happening. Def name self node. So self dot show node. So this is our tree now. So you see the function name contains the arguments. These arguments are going to be put in the register by the register locator. And then I want to return an expression which is a name. So I need to write the logic. I need to write the logic to load the name from the register and uh, um, to, well, to put it on the stack. So which register? Well, of course, uh, we have a register allocator, so the register allocator takes care of giving me the correct register from the name of the variable, which is node.id, and then I can push sd rec. And T should be enough to pass the test because now we are doing the same as before, but instead of having a num, we have a name which puts the right value on the stack, and it works. I'm impressed that it works. Um, I'm not doing any dummy mistake. So let's try something more complex. Now things are getting interesting. So and so we want to handle operation now. So. How, how does, does it look like? So we need a bin op node. So the bin op self node, self dot show node. Let's see how it looks like. This is the tree. So you see that now you can you start to see the recursive structure of the tree. So you have function def with as a return statement, the return statement as a bin op expression, which is add, and the two arguments, the two operands to the expression are two names, A and B. So we need to, so the, the idea is that to implement a binary operation, we want to visit the left children, to, put, to evaluate it and to put it on top of the stack, then to visit the, the right, to put it on top of the stack, then we push the two values from the stack, we add them together and we we'll push the value again on the stack. So in this way, if you have a complex expression with many binary operations and parentheses and etc., well, by doing this push and pop, you get the right precedent, precedence of operands. Oh, the segmentation fault. I managed to get a sec fault. You. So for example, in this case, the op name, so the add that you, you see in the, in, in the picture, is, is basically is the, is the, the name of the class. Of the op attribute of the node. So what I want to do is to, well, for now, I just, I'm just implementing the add, so the addition. So what, what we want to do is to visit the left children to visit the right children. And then I want to pop the right value on the temporary register one. I want to pop the second value. I want to add them together. So the add sd assembly instruction is basically a plus equal. So it's going to, to sum temp0 and temp1 and to put the result in temp0. 
So now I want to put the result of this in uh, um, the result of this on the stack. Right? So if everything is okay, it should work. Okay. Add SD. And it works. So next test. Okay, I want to check that I can use more instruction and not only the add, so the assertion is, is failing because, well, it, it, the operation is no longer the add, so what we want to do is something like this. Okay, let's see if I can copy and paste to speed up things. Something like this. So for every for each instruction I, I get a new operation. So what I can do is something like ops of op name and then call it and see see how it's working. So next next test is assign. I want to be able to assign a variable to the um, assign values to the variable, so I need to implement this assign node. And again, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cheat a lot, and instead of typing, I will just copy and paste, sorry. But, but by doing this way, we are going to have more time for questions. So what's happening here? But as you as you can understand now, the logic is, is similar. So the node of targets is the name of what contains the variable, the name of the variable for the assignment. So I get the register corresponding to the variable. I visit the value. I put it on the stack. I pop I pop it and I move the value from the stack into the the register which which represent the variable. And, uh, and so then we have something which is a bit more complex, which is if, so now we have to do labels. So as ag again, I, I'm going to cheat a while. So basically the idea of, of this is that I want to Okay, I'll show you the node, it's easier. Okay, so, so you see now the, 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 the trick is getting complex, but basically the if as a test, which, which is, the te is the expression in, in the if, and then it has a body argument which contains what you want to do in, in case the 10 the, the, the condition is true. And it also has a else clause, but we are not going to implement it. So, so what we want to do is to check that that we don't have any else because we are not going to implement it. Then to declare a label for the 10, to declare a label for the end. So these are points in, to which we can jump. So we are, this is the pseudo code we are going to generate, and now I'm going to generate it for real. So the operation is, uh, the test operation is inside the test attribute. So we are going to visit and evaluate and put it on the stack we are going to implement only the less than comparison for now. So if it's a less than, so I have the value on the stack, so I can jump if it is below, and if it, 
and I jump to the 10 label. And if, if I didn't jump to the 10 label, I want to jump to the land label. So it's asm.jmp and label. And then I can declare, I can uh, declare what, where is the label. So at this point in the assembler, this is the, it's where my 10 label it is. So it means that if this, basically if the condition is true, I'm jumping from to this point and I'm not executing the jump to the end. So this is how the if works at the low level. And then I can visit I can visit the children. And so by doing this, it means that if the condition is true, we jump from here to here, and then we are emitting the, 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 the code for the return, for example. And if it, the condition was false, we jump to the end label, which is here. And so we don't execute anything, basically. So this is the, the, the logic. Um, again, I am running out of time, so I will copy and paste the compare, which is the same logic again and again. So I, I visit the left node for the comparison, I, I, I visit the, le the right node, and uh, I use this instruction to say, okay, I, I want to compare them, and then and depending on what, is the, what was the comparison, in this case it was LT, then I know here that I, I, I had to use jump below. If it was like uh, uh, LE, so which is less equal, I, I had to use jump below or equal or something like, that, something like this. So let's see if it works. Assertion error. Maybe I don't think it's known, but probably it's an empty list now that I think of it. Yep, yes, not. Mm. So, set.asm. It is not working, the pair program. You should have told me that I was wrong. <laughs> I mean, this is not pair program. It's like 100 people programming. Okay, it's working. So, the basically then, you have the same thing for a while loop, which I'm not going to to write live because it doesn't make sense. It's really the very same, the very same logic. I can just copy and paste and implement it this way. Okay, so now we have a JIT compiler which can do all these things. We can do while, we can do ifs, we can do assignment. So this is the logic for the while, you see. We can do comparison and etc. So we have like a complete enough system, I also want to add a decorator so I can write a nice jit.compile around a Python function. So how do I implement it? Well, I implement the compile function here. It takes a function. I get the source code from inspect.getSourceFN. Then I I instantiate a G AST compiler and I compile it to a JIT compiler function. So let's see if it works. It, do, it does. So basically now my JIT compiler is complete and I can try it with something real. So I have this benchmark. This is a function which computes in a very inefficient way the, the, the digits of P. And I'm going to run it on top, uh, uh, on top of CPython, like normally. And then I am going to JIT compile it using my compiler here. And then let's see if it's faster or not. Well, disclaimer it is. If it doesn't seg fault. Okay, so you see it's more than 10 times faster. And uh, so basically it's, because what happened is that we are compiling this, putting into assembler, executing the assembler, and of course it's faster than, than, than uh, CPython. Just for the sake, if, if we're running on top of PyPy, 
it's even much faster, well, because PyPy is a real JIT compiler. It is a toy JIT compiler which is not optimized for speed. And by the way, in a few minutes, there will be a, a, another talk about the PyPy JIT compiler by Ronan. And so if you are interested in see how PyPy managed to be 10 times faster than T, a simple thing, well, you should listen to him. And uh, so basically, that's it. Before ending, I want to challenge you because I, I, I yes. We have this game, write your own JIT. So this is the GitHub repo for with containing this code. So I, uh, you are welcome to fork it, to add new features, new statements, new operation, whatever you want. You send me a pull request. I won't accept the pull request because I need the, the toy language for the talks, but I will maintain a list of interesting pull requests to show people if, how, how to extend this. So I think I am done. And if you have question, I... Thank you, Antonio, for the amazing talk. So any questions, please come to the microphones. Oh, there is a question there. Um, I don't think I understand the return statement. I'm not sure if it, um, does it actually use the return register or does it just take the last thing that was in the stack and return it? So, uh, return statement is here. So basically the calling conversion of x86 for function using returning a double, it, it, it is that you need to put the return value in the XMM0 register and then re execute the RET assembler instruction, which is, um, which is this. So what, I, what I'm doing is to visit the, the, the node containing the expression. So when I do return 100, 100 is the node dot value in this example. So I visit it, I compute the value, I put it on, the, on top of the stack of, of the x86 stack, and then I put the, this value in the XMM0 register and then execute the RET. And uh, that's wh the where do you put it in that register? Hmm? Where, where do you actually put it in the register? Uh, After you it's, uh, it's here, the pop SD. So pop SD is, an, is a, well, it's a helper that I wrote uh, to, okay. to pop the value from the stack into a register. Okay, all right, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I have another question here. Hey, uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the impressive uh, live coding session. Um, do you, uh, like, there is no handling of, like, overflow. Like, if you, instead of returning 100, you return, like, uh, 10, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah. billions. Yes, it's gonna, it's gonna take fault or something? No, yes, I mean, uh, we are using a floating point. So even in Python, there is no handling of the overflow. If you're using double variables, I mean, float variables, uh, they just well, overflow or get to inf or whatever. Okay, so the num class actually converts everything to floating points? Yes, okay. it's something that, for simplicity, we are using only floating point variables here. Okay. So, yes, I mean. Okay, any other questions? Well, we have time. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Okay. Since you're a PyPy developer, yes, my 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 understanding was that you were working on this kind of code. Yet mm. you said that you did, never did assembly code right. before. So, what the, are you doing? When <laughs> you're doing PyPy, I'm pretending huh? to work on PyPy and get uh, and, and the others do the real work. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I mean PyPy is a complex project and uh, it has very various, various layers. So what we do for JIT compiling is that you, you start from the Python code, you do many layers of things, and then at some point you, uh, you end up with an intermediate code which is similar to the assembler, but it's, it, but, but, uh, it's generic. And then we have many backends, so from this intermediate code you can compile for x86, you can compile for ARM, you can compile for PowerPC, and this is the job of the backend. So when you write a new JIT backend, you turn this intermediate into real assembler, but I never worked on any backend for real CPUs. I worked on a backend for the .NET virtual machines years ago. And so most of my work in PyPy is above this level. So I do things which produce the intermediate representation, 
But then it's the job of the back end, and uh, well, I'm not an expert of them. Armin it is, <laughs> if you want. So that's, that, 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 that's why I never had to write any real assembler. But of course, the intermediate language is close enough that you, you still need to, to think about registers and uh, variables and stocks and et cetera. So. Thank you. OK. Any more questions? Okay, so okay. then I guess thank you again. You're welcome.